like to uh, convene the uh, Ways and Means uh, Committee. And uh, Representative Nelson, have you had a chance to look at the minutes? Yes, See and I move approval. Yeah, open. <laughs> yeah, I move approval of the minutes. Okay, the motion uh, is before us to uh, approve the minutes of March 11, 2019. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, the first bill that we have up uh, this morning is House File 286 <laughs> by Representative uh, Hornstein. The uh, rail uh, carrier uh, minimum crew size required. Um, <coughs> Representative uh, Hornstein, would you care to move the uh, division report? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, move the division report on, uh, this is the Transportation Finance and Policy Division report on House File 286, 286. Okay, the motion is before us. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, then Representative Torkelson. Yeah, could you clarify the motion, Mr. Chair? We're adopting the uh, committee oh, report yeah. from the Transportation so Committee. So this isn't sending it anywhere yet? No. All right, I'll wait. So the uh, motion before us, just adopt the uh, committee report, and then there will be a follow-up motion uh, by Representative Hornstein. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move House File 286 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Okay, that motion is uh, before us. Representative Hornstein, would you care to uh, tell us a little bit about the bill? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, House File 286 uh, uh, is a requirement for a two-person crew on freight railroad lines. Uh, this legislation has been passed in several other states. Um, it came to my attention uh, back in 2013, uh, there were a number of high-profile um, uh, accidents involving uh, freight rail uh, in other states uh, and in uh, Minnesota, uh, particularly as it relates to oil and other hazardous materials, and I view this as a, uh, a safety uh, question above all, and uh, that's why I'm uh, supportive and hope you'll be supportive of this legislation. Okay, the motion is before us. Any discussion? Representative Torkel. My first question, Mr. Chair, is, is to the path of this bill. It was my understanding as it left uh, transportation that it was going to be re-referred to the Public Safety Committee. Uh, in fact, the Chair made a remark to that effect at the time. Uh, there are new fines in this bill and a misdemeanor. I'm just curious why it's not going to Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did uh, my understanding, and I didn't have a direct conversation with Chair Mariani, but uh, my understanding was that uh, uh, the committee um, has uh, either, um, I think, has some custom and usage around the level of the fine, and uh, apparently this was not, it didn't meet that uh, criteria. But um, it was, uh, Representative Torkelson is correct that um, I think we did make a motion to ways and means uh, with the possible recommendation to public safety. But that's my understanding uh, indirectly from uh, public safety staff. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, uh, that was the recommendation. I would be the one that would generally uh, refer it to additional divisions. And we did uh, get a, uh, an email um, from uh, House research, uh, public safety typically does not hear misdemeanor penalties from chapters other than 609, 617, 624. I don't think uh, they need to see this bill. So we relied on uh, house research in that regard. But it, uh, it only deals with uh, misdemeanors and they would not uh, normally uh, then be hearing those bills. So we did uh, check on it. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, pardon. Oh, I didn't see your hand go up, Representative oh, Torkelson. We're Representative Torkelson. Line of sight is somewhat lost. Well, thank you, Mr. Just Chair. Just kindly saw your hand go up. I didn't. She my understanding from what happened keeps in, me on in the, the narrow. Transportation Committee. Uh, but to the bill itself, uh, Chair Hornstein, um, there are fines, additional fines in this bill, who, and tickets that could be issued. Who would the tickets be issued to? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, 
uh, Representative Torkelson, my understanding of it would be the uh, the railroad that uh, uh, violates the section that's in um, 1.11 in the bill. Representative Thank Torkelson. you, Mr. Chair. And then who would pay the fine? Um, that would, my uh, assumption would be that would be, again, the violate, the violation, the, the violating railroad company. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and Mr. Chair. Um, so we've seen evidence in committee that uh, railroads are actually getting safer with the current crew set up. So is there some empirical evidence that would indicate that this is actually going to make railroads safer? Representative Hornstein. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Torkelson, I think that uh, uh, there are a number of, um, uh, there is a, uh, sense that in some of these accidents that had there been uh, additional crew, uh, especially in terms of emergency response, there would have been um, uh, a beneficial uh, piece to that. Uh, we heard that kind of testimony also in the, um, uh, in the committee. And I think as we head towards uh, uh, perhaps increased automation, you know, I look at this as uh, having uh, two pilots in an in a aircraft as opposed to one. And I think, uh, you know, given all kinds of issues that may happen to, to one operator, I think it's really, really uh, helpful in terms of public safety to have uh, two operators and a back, you know, one and a backup. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. So uh, Met Council operates a number of trains. I believe they operate all of them with a single operator. Are you going to suggest that uh, we broaden this requirement to put, uh, for instance, two operators in a light rail train? Mr. Chairman, Representative Torkelson, um, we are looking at trains that, uh, unit trains of 100 tanker cars of very highly volatile oil uh, rumbling through our neighborhoods uh, and communities. This has been brought up many times on the House floor in the con broader context of our oil transportation discussion. It's not just oil, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Torkelson, there's uh, anhydrous ammonia, um, other hazardous products, and uh, that's certainly not analogous to a light rail uh, train. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. The testimony we've heard mostly deals with the result of a train car accident, uh, not really having anything to do with what the train is carrying. And we've had uh, certainly a lot of testimony on another bill about a light rail car accident where injuries, fatal injuries occurred. Uh, it seems like there's a close correlation. Representative Hornstein. Well, I, I would just <clears throat> reiterate my earlier statement that I don't necessarily see uh, an analogy to, uh, you know, again, with the, the incident in Lac Megante, Quebec, was one of the um, motivators for me on this, and this was a uh, an accident where 47 people perished in a fireball, and we have to be very, very careful about um, ensuring safety when these uh, very uh, hazardous materials are uh, transported through our communities. In very cl close proximity, as the as former Speaker Dowd has pointed out, close proximity to schools, hospitals. Uh, uh, residences. Um, this is a very important issue for our state. Representative Turkelson is that. Uh, Representative Hurtos. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Hornstein. Uh, I too uh, express some concern a little bit uh, with regard to the uh, actual products that are being moved. Uh, freight trains move freight, and we've got light rail uh, transports people, and yet the light rail, uh, you know, government run is exempt from this uh, uh, proposed bill that you have. And, you know, I think that we see the private investment in the private sector rail service in terms of rebuilding uh, the amount of dollars and miles that they spend in upgrading the lines and the systems. And I'm also aware of many, many of us probably don't think too much about seeing a train go by one direction and 10 minutes later you see the train go in the other direction. And you wonder how that can be, but it's very sophisticated logistics in terms of managing and caring for freight uh, that's being shipped. And 
you know, one of the innovations that I'm seeing even in consumer vehicles is the fact that uh, in my own car now, it displays the speed limit in the windshield. And I notice that when I come to a regulatory sign, it immediately knows that the speed has changed and you'll see a change in the windshield. And that can only be due to the technologies of GPS knowing exactly where those regulatory signs are. And I make this point, uh, Representative, that the same type of technologies exist with regard to operating uh, freight rail. They know exactly where every crossing is. A lot of the uh, sophisticated technologies in the trains uh, warn of these things, but yet uh, if there were two people in the recent light rail crash that took a young man's life, maybe that other person would have noticed there was a red light rather than driving straight through it. So that's the biggest concern I have with your legislation is uh, it really isn't addressing the most valuable cargo. Uh, that's the people that are on light rail trains. Okay, we have uh, Representative Draskowski. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hornstein, which other states have this uh, additional government mandated regulation? Representative Hornstein. I know Wisconsin is one of them. Uh, I'm not sure we have some others in the uh, audience that might be able to just whisper in my ear and let me know. California, Arizona, and West Virginia, and our neighbors to the east. Representative Skousky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, I, I suspected California, um, <laughs> and I expected, you know, New York and Connecticut and some other places, too, but, uh, 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 well, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Representative Hornstein, uh, certainly I, I expect that uh, the unions are advocating for this. Um, and it's um, it's it, it, it's it's not a good thing that we are uh, bringing a bill forward for government, obviously, to dictate to the railroads how they need to operate and spend uh, their money to make their railroads safer. Um, but um, I know I have been approached by the unions in past sessions, Representative Horst Arnstein, so I know who's bringing the bill. It's the unions because they want more membership and they want more dues and they want to make themselves stronger. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with um, making the railroad safer. Um, this is about a special interest bringing a bill forward and having government leverage its position right now here in Minnesota to dictate to the railroads that they are going to have more union employees and that's just the way it is. And so they're going to have to spend that money there. They're not going to be able to spend it on innovative technologies uh, to make railroads even safer or move goods even cheaper uh, as they normally would operate. But instead, we're going to have this impediment in government in there uh, that is going to limit them, limit commerce in our state, and slow Minnesota down relative to the rest of the country once again. So. Um, my frustrations with the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. And uh, I thought there were more blue states in your list. <laughs> Representative Houseman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, um, there's a, in, in your packets, there are quite a number of, of um, handouts, but one that is uh, helpful to know who is bringing this. Uh, the, the first page is the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Uh, the second page is from the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, who say in their letter, safety concerns about freight trains have become more pronounced for city leaders and residents as the number and length of trains have increased due to frac sand and crude oil entering the state by rail to and from North Dakota. During the 2015 interim, a committee of city officials spent considerable time learning about and discussing freight rail safety issues. They recommended um, the policy language we're discussing. Um, the two, the two um, letters following that come from the Minnesota Professional Firefighters and the Minnesota State Patrol, all of whom I suspect know something about um, safe response to accidents. I think it's important for the record to indicate who's bringing the bill. Okay, and uh, Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm 
you know, Representative Hornstein, you and I worked on train safety legislation uh, jointly several years ago when I was chairing the uh, property tax division and we were looking at some strategies there. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing from the other side some opposition. Um, I, I think back to our public safety workers where we talk frequently about they want to go home to their families at night. And this is a public safety measure and I want these train workers to go home to their families at night as well. And that fundamentally is the question in front of us is do we work with the railroad industry and the railroad workers to make sure that the trains are operated in a safe manner that allows uh, their passage through our communities and across our state to be done in as safe a way as possible and to make sure that the the workers are safe and get to go home at night. Um, I appreciate your bringing this forward because I would hope that uh, people uh, living long and healthy lives is a goal we can all embrace. Thank you, Rep Chair Hornstein. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, Chair. Thank you, Representative Davney. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, you know, these fiscal notes that we get um, only um, tell about the cost to government. And I'm just wondering um, what the cost to the railroads and the private sector would be if anyone has an idea of what this is going to cost um, the private sector. And I'm sure that they'll be passing along those um, increases to uh, the consumer. And I just don't know if there's anybody in the audience that could answer that question or if they have an idea. Mr. Chair, thank you. I don't. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you, go, come, you can come forward if you'd like and identify. You, you, if you have info, did you hear the question? <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, my name is Philip Qualley. I'm state director for the uh, Smart Transportation Division, formerly the United Transportation Union. And to answer your question, there is no increase in cost. I think there's a misconception with this bill that we're talking about actually increasing uh, numbers of train crews, we're not. We're simply maintaining the train crews and the level of safety and the level of productivity and efficiency that the companies are enjoying now. Our primary responsibility is to protect public safety. That is our motivation. And we're asking for your support for this bill because we feel we are Minnesotans first. We are Minnesotans first and we are trying to protect the public. Thank you. Representative Scott. Okay, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Representative Hordenstein. Good morning. Uh, this is the first time that I've heard this bill, I, and so I just have a question. It seems to me that the cruise size has always been an issue that has been relevant to the collective bargaining uh, process. And so I'm just wondering from the perspective that I come from in terms of what has changed that has brought this bill forward. Thank you. Representative Arnstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Albright. I, that's a great question, and I, I think I, I return to Representative Hausman's point that um, we have many more stakeholders in this uh, issue uh, beyond uh, the unions and management. Um, you have the League of Cities, you have citizens groups, you have uh, public safety professionals, um, and I think what's changed is that, uh, you know, I think the nature of transporting hazardous materials has changed. and. And I think, again, the catalyst for me, and I think for many others who have been involved and concerned about rail safety, you know, does have to do with these high-profile uh, accidents that did involve deaths and injuries, uh, both, uh, you know, particularly in surrounding communities. Uh, and uh, uh, environmental issues, we've had um, ethanol trains that have leaked into the Mississippi River. Um, and uh, in other incidents, there was um, a leakage on a train that was going from Red Wing to Winona. Uh, several years ago, and had that not been in winter time, I think we would have had uh, a pretty major problem on the Mississippi River. So um, that, that's really what's changed, and I think it, it, this does go beyond collective bargaining to a real broader community safety issue. Okay, we have uh, Representative Bernardi. I just wanted to briefly say we're using the words accidents a lot today, and these are derailments. One happened in my community not too long ago, and my community has very serious concerns about derailments, and this is an important bill for safety because it happened right in my own community, and it 
we were fortunate that it was a corn, but really not that fortunate than the fact that it created a huge mess and a huge impact on the homeowners in that area with little um, addressing the issues by the railroad. And so um, this is this doesn't necessarily affect the corn going in it, but derailments happen, and this is an important um, bill to pass for the safety of our public. Okay, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hornstein, you mentioned Wisconsin earlier. It's my understanding that the Wisconsin law has been overturned by the courts. Is that uh, correct? Perhaps your buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer? <laughs> Did you hear the question? Yeah, and I would, Mr. Chair, I'd call on Mr. Qualley to respond. Mr. Chairman, uh, again, Philip Qualley, I'd be uh, happy to defer this to our council that is here, uh, but short summary, <clears throat> following the Wyawega train wreck in Wisconsin in 1997 or so, uh, where is heroic work by the train crew to keep a town from blowing up. Uh, the town was evacuated for, uh, I believe, 10 days. The state of Wisconsin passed a two-person crew law. Uh, the law in total was challenged by the railroads on federal preemption grounds. A portion of the state legislation in Wisconsin was ruled preempted. The standing portion of the law, of the Wisconsin law, which is still valid today, in which our bill in Minnesota, in California, West Virginia, Arizona, and in 20 other states across the United States, is the remaining portion. So this legislation is not federally preempted, and it has not been tested <coughs> in the federal courts by the railroads subsequent to the California passage most recently in 2014. Mr. Chairman Torkelson, Chairman, uh, Mr. Tor Representative Torkelson, excuse me, I'm not necessarily bloody. Uh, Representative Torkelson, thank you. I hope that answers your question. Representative Torkelson. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my understanding is the West Virginia law is, is only goes into effect if surrounding states pass similar legislation. Is that correct? I cannot speak to the West Virginia law other than it was brought up uh, under the Conrail Termination Act and um, the court wrote, if I may recite, um, first of all, uh, that part of the Conrail Termination Act has been reserved by the courts, uh, but the statutory purpose uh, was originally enacted and has been clear, as I quote, excuse me, the uh, Federal Railroad Safety Act and the Federal Railroad Administration comments of 2011 concluded that the statutory purpose for which Section 711-797-J was originally enacted has been clearly satisfi satisfied. This is the West Virginia law. Conrail has been successfully returned to the private sector and no longer requires a special statutory exemption from state laws requiring it to employ a specific number of persons or persons in any particular task, function, or operation. Subsequently, in 2008, uh, the FRA wrote, railroad carriers challenged the rule, prevailed, subsequently and affirmatively post-RSA 2008, that area of the law has been reserved. Um, it is returned, it is appropriate, that purpose has been met and it is appropriate to return primacy to state law. And I'm not an attorney and so therefore after that I would re refer to our counsel. But again, it says that Primacy has been returned to state law. Okay, let's see. We next have uh, Chair, oh, I one more question that relates to the cost of the railroads, and I believe that the railroads are prepared to remark on uh, what uh, some of this testimony and what it may cost the railroads. Yeah, Representative Torkelson, uh, if you have a question of a person, that'll be fine. We'll entertain the question. So, who is your question posed? Uh, my question would be the author, and do you, Representative Hornstein, do you? understand the impact of this on the commercial railroads. Representative Hornstein. Mr. Chair, Representative Torgelson, yes. Uh, and I believe that, uh, again, as Mr. Qualley has pointed out, um, we are uh, preserving the status quo, uh, which is a two-person crew. Um, and so I, I think that the railroads can certainly absorb uh, this co the, any costs that are accrue from this uh, legislation. Representative Torkelson. Oh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to hear that directly from the railroads if possible. Yeah, we'll entertain the question then. Is there a spokesperson from the railroad that wants to entertain that question? 
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Lydia Bjorgi. I'm with BNSF Railway. There have been extensive studies on the cost of not being able to find efficiencies um, by taking away our ability to, co to collectively bargain crew size, which is how it's been done for decades. I'll pass along that information and the studies um, found in that information to the committee after committee today. I also, okay. if you're willing, would like to address the state, other state law issues. Yep. Mr. Chair. Representative Tarkelson, is that part of your question? Yes, it is, Mr. Chair. Specific to Wisconsin, um, like Mr. Qualley said, part of that law was overturned by the courts at the time. The FRA had not acted on the other piece of law, so the it was found that the in the yard moves were federally preempt because the FRA had acted in um, the circumstances of dictating how many crew and what the crew consist is for inside the yard, but not over the road. Since the time of that case, which was a Doyle versus BNSF case, the FRA has taken substantial further action on the issue of crew size for over the road. And if re-litigated, we feel we would be successful in the preemption argument. There, of the four states that Mr. Qualley mentioned, there are no states that currently um, cite or in any way, um, I'm trying to find the right word, in any way require the, the um, two, two people in the cab. So, that, so short lines use one person in the cab in Wisconsin, California, West Virginia, Arizona. So they're, they're not enforced in any of those four states. Representative Torkelson is that? Uh, I've got a question of you while you're at the table. What's the uh, length of a train these days? And how many cars would it typically have? Mr. Chair, typically 100, 110 cars is the standard. And that would be in terms of length? About a mile. About a mile, okay. I think that's interesting as far as this discussion goes. Uh, Representative uh, Driskowski. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Bierke, if you would. Um, uh, Ms. Bierke? Is it Bierke? Welcome would, back. Mr. Chair, Representative Driskowski. Um, how, so uh, uh, Mr. Qualley mentioned four selected states, but then sure. went on to mention there were 20. Um, what are the other states and how blue are they? I think that's a good point. So, so Wisconsin, we address California passed has never been enforced. Um, West Virginia, there's statute in the books, but again, it doesn't go into effect unless all other surrounding states have the law. Arizona is not in effect. It was actually um, um, uh, an anti feather bedding statute that was passed that essentially took that statute out of play. In fact, the unions have introduced legislation in Arizona again, so that tells you something. The other 20 states, I think, was the number that Mr. Kowali mentioned. Um, I imagine that's the number of states this bill has been introduced, uh, but is they're absolutely not law and is not, again, not enforced in any other state in the nation. So, Mr. Chair, Representative Scott. then is it is the only state that it's actually being implemented in California? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Draskowski, it is it is currently on the books in California. It is not enforced, meaning there are short lines in California who run one person crews and there has never been a citation or an enforcement of action in the state of California against those one person crews, despite it being on the books. Wow. So, Mr. Chair, it sounds like uh, it sounds like uh, we're going to place ourselves into uh, into a, uh, a situation that um, puts us at a competitive disadvantage to all those states. Thank you, Ms. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Rep. Hornstein, care to uh, renew your motion? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. I uh, renew my motion that House File 286 be recommended to be placed on the general register. We just had another name pop up. I was going <laughs> by the list was complete, but Representative Garofalo. My apologies, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to wrap things up, and that is that um, I actually I want to disagree with my colleague, Representative Draskowski. I have no concerns about this bill becoming law because it's not going to become law. So that's not a... That's not an issue. Uh, what we're seeing, members, is that in a time when we're more successfully deploying technology, automation, and computerization, that we're seeing um, legacy institutions attempt to uh, thwart that technology and those enhancements in productivity, in productivity by preserving the existing uh, labor structure they have. Um, 
applying the same mindset to trucks is going to make a very difficult case for the automation that's coming in the trucking industry. And uh, I would ask members to oppose this bill and say that we should allow this to be handled at the collective <coughs> bargaining level between the unions and the railroads. And I would ask members for a no vote. Thank you. Hey, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, then uh, the motion is before us. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. Um, the next bill on Thank the Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. You're very welcome. And the next bill uh, is uh, 682, Representative Pulaski, the Disaster Contingency Account. Uh, Representative Pulaski. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move the division report. Okay, the motion is before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Pulowski. Then I'll move uh, that House File 682 be recommended to pass and be placed on the general register. Okay, the motion is before us. Uh, <laughs> if you'd care to explain the bill, Representative Pulowski. Uh, sure. House File 682 is a bill that has received uh, a great deal of discussion this session. The Greater Minnesota, or the Greater Minnesota Economic Development Committee has had two hearings just on this bill and the disaster account this session. There have been numerous bills introduced. What this bill does is backfill the account, which was underfunded for the last few years, add stability to the account, and then puts it in a position where if it has to be accessed, at least there would be funds in it. I believe we're down to about $100,000 in the account right now. The, uh, the history of this goes back to the disaster of 27, of, uh, 2007, actually, with the uh, Rushford area and the creation of uh, what, was, what was then Chapter 12A and subsequently Chapter 12B. Chapter 12B is where the account exists. We have two levels of disaster we can declare in this state natural disasters. One is a presidential, the other is, the other is a gubernatorial. So with that, Mr. Chair, the bill simply adds stability to the account and there will be other legislation coming during the budget so that when we are not in session, this account can be accessed. And I did have one document that I gave you. Uh, this was the last time that we had a special session for disaster relief in 2013. And you can see the agreement is here, uh, signed by both Republicans and Democrats. And you can also see in the first paragraph that the word appropriation is spelled three different ways. <laughs> and this is one of the reasons why a special session is not very special. <laughs> we should at least have the time to be able to spell the word appropriation. So when I do the, this is from a presentation I've done numerous times in the public. If we can't spell appropriation, we shouldn't be allowed to do it. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll open for questions. Okay, any uh, discussion uh, either on the spelling of the word appropriation or uh, the bill itself? Representative Groff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Pulaski. I would ask members to support this bill. Uh, again, uh, disaster relief is something that uh, we come together with on a bipartisan basis. The reforms that Representative Pulaski has mentioned are a good idea so that we're not uh, held up in global agreements uh, going forward here so that in future uh, disasters do not require a special session. So I'd ask members to support this bill. Okay, Representative Dabney. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pulaski, I want to thank you as well for bringing this, this forward. You've done good work uh, over many years to establish this disaster contingency account. It was wise efforts. I think I, I see this, you know, to Representative Garofalo's use of the term global, I, I do see this as, as uh, increasingly uh, are anticipating uh, natural disasters from global climate change. And I think the more we anticipate those disasters and prepare ourselves for the flooding, uh, the the uh, abrupt snowfalls, things like that, the the wiser we are. So thank you, Representative Pulaski, for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to make a, just Pulaski. a comment on uh, what's been said. Both chapters 12A and 12B were prepared over the interim. Each of these chapters of law had as many as a dozen drafts that were rotated through the 13 different agencies and then the local units of government before the bill was introduced. So that once the bill was introduced, 
we had a fairly good idea of how this was going to work. I'm, this is not Pulowski's disaster bill. This, I facilitated creating two chapters of law with the entities that were the experts on how this had to work. And the one thing we should all be proudest of, this has worked flawlessly in every disaster we have had since 2007. And we can't say that about many pieces of legislation. And there are people in the room today that should be given a lot of credit, the Department of Public Safety. I would also say DEED. But I'd also say all of the entities, the different agencies that continue to work on this, as we know, the disasters have changed. They have come at us from very different ways than we anticipated. We just passed a special bill last week on a unique type of a disaster dealing with agriculture. So these bills are going to have to continually be improved. And, we, and I, I, I appreciate the comment about being bipartisan. This issue should never be partisan. This should be when we are state's people. This is the, this is the best way this legislature has acted, and it must continue to act that way. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. And Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Plowski. I want to thank you for sharing the, the burden of uh, both 12A and 12B with regard to disasters. And uh, one of the communities that uh, is my district right now is um, inundated by floodwaters to the extent that we've got backhoes trying to break up uh, ice dams to save a trailer park uh, from what I think is almost an imminent disaster. Um, my point and my question to you, sir, is to the point of sufficiency. I know the bill suggests $10 million, and uh, there are a number of other proposals that uh, uh, suggest a, a larger number, and I'm wondering if there's anything that you might suggest uh, uh, from an op-ed perspective in terms of what a sufficiency amount in this um, account might be in the interim when the legislature is not in session that would at least get the ball rolling um, forward so these communities uh, don't have to wait for a special session. Mr. Chair and Love. Representative Albright, we're looking at at least 20 million, 10 million in each year of the biennium uh, for funding. And we may actually see more than that considering what's happened uh, with weather over the recent uh, winter. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in the budget that we will have before the House and the governor's recommendation, we'll have a minimum of about 20 million that will be in the account. And remember, this is only accessed when there is a disaster. If the governor calls it or the president, it still has to be okayed by House and Senate leadership. And then protocols are put in place. And this does not pay for the entire disaster. This pays for things that have to be paid up front and then we will get the bill. But the bill will be an accurate bill, not like it was when we had the disaster in southeastern Minnesota, when we were throwing money at everything. This, these bills have worked. And of course, the, the one that uh, comes to mind is in uh, 2015, when Representative Knobloch carried the first of the bills. I think it was House File 164. And that paid for the disaster of 2013. So this is, this is exactly what we need to do. And we should do it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Dabney? Were you, are you where I, oh. I thought you were on our list. Okay, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, <coughs> Rep. Pulowski, uh, for carrying this bill. Um, I, too, share the concern about the adequacy of the funding. But with that said, I think you partly answered my, my other concern or question. If, if we were to park money or to reserve money and have it available so it could be used and acted upon quickly, um, is there any type of uh, safeguards or oversight that um, that a governor may uh, not overspend the situation or make sure that the, the money is used in its most efficient manner or wisely and not just uh, at the sole discretion of, of one person just decide how much money an area is going to get? Uh, Mr. Chair, reps have heard us. There is no funding in this process that is at the whim of any individual. Once a declaration is made, you have both federal and state law that now go into a series of protocols. And they will address the, the limits to what the spending will be or the amounts that will be spent in certain categories. But again, and then we review it when it comes to us. So there should, there's never been a difficulty here 
with spending. The difficulty was when we had a special session, and then when the legislative auditor did a review in 2012 of what happened during that special session, then we had problems. And that's when 12A was created, and then 12B, to make sure that we could not have that happen again. And, and the result was unfortunate for certain areas of southeastern Minnesota. There were, uh, shall we say, elected officials that did not return to office. Representative Hurtfels. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Rep. Pulowski, for that. I remember that uh, we passed the bill in 13. I just didn't remember some of the details of it, so thank you for filling me, that, filling me in on that. And uh, I, I'm happy to appropriate or appropriate, or however we spell it, uh, money to this bill. <laughs> hey, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would note that there is a, a challenge with small communities in large counties that may have a disaster uh, and because of the per capita uh, the inability to have a disaster declaration because of the size of the county and I'll use specifically Representative Albright I think you remember this the city of Mendota which if Mendota was located in a rural county it would have been eligible but it was in Dakota County so a town of 110 people had to come up with sixty thousand dollars for a road going down the bluff and they never got reimbursed for that. And we spent a very long time trying to work to see if the fund would cover it. So uh, nothing's perfect. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Well, seeing none then, uh, the uh, Pulaski motion that uh, House File 682 be recommended to be placed on the General Register um, is before us. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Thank Pulaski. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we now go to uh, House File 85, Representative uh, Brand. Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling. Mr. Chair, I move adoption of the Health and Human Services Finance Division report on House File 85. Okay, the motion is before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and now I will move House File 85, the first engrossment, to be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Would you care to uh, explain the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, yes, House, House File 85 is a bill uh, that's uh, similar to what we've seen before in the House. Any, anyone in this uh, committee could have carried this bill. Uh, it, it, it represents people across the state that have rare diseases in which it would be best if EMS professionals were to give or uh, administer life-saving drugs at the time of arrival versus hauling them back to the hospital where a doctor would administer those life-saving drugs. And so we all, in each of our uh, districts, we have uh, folks that have rare diseases. And so it's it's important, I believe, that we carry this bill forward. It was in the budget bill last year, but it was vetoed. And so, uh, you know, with bipartisan support, bipartisan support on this bill this year. Uh, what it does is authorizes EMTs, AMTs, and paramedics to administer those drugs and uh, would require the EMS board to develop protocols and then report back to the legislature next year. We would adopt those protocols, I hope, and then we would carry this forward. Okay, any uh, discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the author, are you aware of any opposition to your bill at all? Representative Brandt. Mr. Chair, Representative Garofalo, initially there was some opposition and we addressed that by amending the bill. Uh, there was some uh, there was some language in there about um, creating a plan or allowing paramedics to help uh, people with rare diseases to create a plan for action in case something would happen. Uh, the Minnesota Nurses Association had some heartburn about that, so we removed it. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that this, this is a piece in the Valley Bill, is the way it was explained to me. So, uh, given that fact, I would ask for members to support it. Appreciate okay, it. any further uh, discussion. Uh, seeing none, then. Um, the motion before us is that House File 85, uh, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Any further discussion? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> we now uh, have uh, House File 408, uh, 
or excuse me, 14 away, uh, by Representative uh, Eagle. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the committee. Welcome to both of you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe there is an amendment as well. Yeah, we have. Uh, oh, there, uh, Representative Ornstein. Uh, You've Mr. Got to move the, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I move adoption of the Transportation Finance and Policy Division report on House File 1408. Okay, the motion is before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Hornstein? I guess I'm okay. the one that needs to move the bill. Um, that wasn't on my feet. So, uh, or I'm the one that could. Um, so uh, I will move to House File 1408 as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. And if you could explain the bill. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, House File 1408 is the flaggers bill. So what this would do is that it would allow flaggers and work zones to cite, um, cite folks who disobey orders just like they do with the um, school bus uh, arm law. Okay, and then there's uh, an amendment that uh, Representative uh, Kegel uh, has requested. So that would just delete yeah. sections and, one. Uh, I will move uh, the amendment uh, for House File 1408 um, in its uh, number 11, A11. It's in our packets. Uh, if you could explain the, the amendment. Yep, so thank you, Mr. Chair. What the um, amendment would do is delete sections one, um, which was some bitter language that um, we could not come to agreement on with MnDOT, and then three sections three and four, which is um, prohibition on cell phone use in work zones. Um, so really what we want to do is just um, keep the meat of the bill, allowing the flaggers to, uh, to, to call peace, uh, police enforcement when um, somebody is in violation of um, obeying their orders in a work zone. Okay, any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, any further uh, discussion? Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question in thinking about this bill, and what is your take on whether or not the flagger will be distracted from their regular duties if they have to deal with trying to uh, make contact with police officers regarding the misbehavior of a driver in their vicinity. Representative Kegel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Torkelson. Um, a lot when we in committee, what we heard is that a lot of these flaggers work in teams, and so um, at one end of the um, uh, work zone, they can let um, the other flagger know that somebody um, disobeyed their orders, and and they can work together to. Um, you know, collect the information they need to, and then they also have up to they have four hours to do that. So um, I believe they would be able to take a break to call in um, any kind of law enforcement they need. Thank you. Rips. Okay. Any further uh, discussion? You vote against it. Okay. <laughs> it's fourteen eight down. Okay. Uh, the motion before us is that House File fourteen oh eight as amended be recommended to be placed on the general registrar. Any uh, further discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. No. no. I just want to uh, commend the author of the bill. I'm just wondering if that if that child would be available for me to borrow when I present the bill uh, to minimize difficult questioning. Are you saying that that helped put the bill over? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, that's exactly. well, I, I suspect we're, I suspect we're going to see the we're going to see the author of the bill on the House floor doing the ex using the exact same tactic. So, I uh, one time uh, we had a very brief floor session, and I had my grandson, who's now a junior in college, with me. That wasn't, I think, maybe a little bit older, uh, who fell sound asleep um, on my shoulder on the House floor. And uh, they took a picture, and it went statewide. So uh, when I realized it went statewide was when Marty Seifert, if you'll remember Marty Seifert, brought in uh, the picture. It had been in the uh, Worthington newspaper. And Mr. Chairman, this was your nephew, you said? Or no, my grandson. grandson. And that grandson's name was Leon Lilly. Mr. Chairman, no, that grandson. I had a good nap. <laughs> um, if we're done with our business, may I ask two quick questions? That's fine. Uh, I think it's kind of you know, tradition in this committee. The minority lead has to ask number one: uh, When do you expect to see the targets out? 
And number two, what is the actual deadline day for when the targets for our house rules need to be released? It's uh, the 25th, and uh, the rule is that um, uh, after the uh, forecast, we have 25 days to put the uh, budget resolution together. So uh, my uh, plan right now is that uh, we will be taking it up on the 25th. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion before we adjourn then? Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.